Today, we're so excited to have back with us Dr. Kendall Williams, and he will be speaking on why I believe in God from a Baha'i perspective. Dr. Kendall Williams, MD, MPH, is a professor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, where he has been engaged in medical student and residency education for over two decades. He founded the Penn Center for Evidence-Based Practice and was the inpatient service chief for Penn Presbyterian for almost 10 years. More recently, he is devoting his free time to developing the Baha'i website, sifterofdust.org, intended to be a resource for people exploring the teachings of the Baha'i faith and its writings. And with that, I'll hand it off to Dr. Williams. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. I'm glad you're uh, here to listen to me talk. Uh, I wanted to give this talk um, and uh, basically to express why I believe in God. And this is from a Baha'i perspective. So it's clearly going to be, an, uh, the other aspect of this talk is that, you know, why the Baha'i faith has really helped me to come to a belief in God. So that's what this presentation is about. It is in some way sort of my, um, my apology, if you will, in the classic sense of theologians who write an apology to describe why they believe something. That's basically what this is. And I was, um, and I'm doing it in the, not because, um, I'm trying to prove anything to anybody else, but rather because uh, I want to share with others why I've come to the beliefs I have come to and why I think they're reasonable so that we can then have a dialogue from that point forward. Um, so this is called Why I Believe in, in God, uh, a Baha'i Perspective. It's really one Baha'i's perspective. And I'm, of course, Kendall Williams. So um, I went the wrong way on my slides. So... Uh, so I come to this as a Baha'i, um, and I think it's important to say a little bit up front about what the Baha'i faith is. You know, Baha'u'llah is the founder of the Baha'i faith. He is what uh, Christ is to Christians or the Prophet Muhammad is to Muslims. He's the founder of the religion, right? And he claimed to be a bearer of a revelation of God to our time in history, just like the Prophet Muhammad did, just like Christ did. But he explained uh, that all the previous revelations of God that of the prophet Muhammad and that of Christ uh, were reflections of the will of God for their time in history. And that Baha'u'llah, what he was doing was really just proclaiming the will of God for our time in history. And Baha'u'llah said that God is the God of all. And the very beautiful line, he says, all things are of God. And so he really proclaimed the end of division and tribalism in all of its forms. And he said this purpose of the human of religion, not only his religion, but all religion is to bring unity to the human race. And Baha'u'llah also upheld the core principles of science and rational thought, which are very attractive to me as a person who, you know, is very critical minded about religion and about life in general. So I'm mean, going to actually follow a path that Baha'u'llah advised us to do in, in, in sort of um, thinking about God. Um, in one of his passages, he says, look at the world and, world and ponder a while upon it. It unveileth the book of its own self before thine eyes and reveals that which the pen of thy Lord, the fashioner, the all-informed, hath inscribed therein. So in this passage, Baha'u'llah is telling us that the world itself, if we look out, look at the world, look at what it shows us, that it will tell us things not only about the nature of itself, but also about the nature of our relationship to God. And that's what we're going to do here. So we're going to take what we might refer to as an empirical approach to understanding uh, God. And empiricism is the basis of modern science, where we basically look at the world and we say, what is it telling us? And, uh, and what conclusions can we draw from it? So, you know, an ancient person standing up uh, on a mountainside like this one, looking out at the vast expanse before him or her, would have naturally assumed that it all came from a source that was uh, intelligent, that it was um, all filled with meaning and purpose. And they would have seen that in everything that uh, existed. So, um, you know, in many ways, our societies have gotten away from that, right? We've gotten away from that because we know so much more about the world that that older look that older perspective of really just assuming that it all came from intelligence has been pushed off to the wayside. And I wanna try and see if we can get back to that a little bit. So I think the first fundamental question for anybody looking at the world and trying to come to a conclusion about it 
in, in vis-a-vis this question of God is, is, is there an intelligent force at the root of life, right? Does it make sense that there would be an intelligent force at the root of life? Because if there isn't, if we can't come up with a way of thinking about that, then we'd say, well, the world came into being through non-intelligent forces. You know, uh, some of the forces that a lot of atheist uh, materialist uh, people would would say are a- actually at the root of life. Um, anybody who believes in religion believes ultimately that there is an intelligent force at the root of life that is responsible for our creation and that, you know, we're in a process of coming to understand that intelligent force, right? So I want to place uh, my comments, though, in a full recognition of where we are and who we are, right? We and we know this now from the investigations of science, we are living on a small, thin film, biofilm, th- that we call our atmosphere and, its, and, and our environment um, that exists on a small planet, the third one from the sun in its solar system, that solar system being one of an almost infinite amount of solar systems that exist. You know, I I was very struck uh, when it was stated once that there are as many stars in the universe as there are grains of sand on all the beaches of the world, right? So we're part of a very vast universe and we're only this small part living in this small sort of biofilm existence. But yet I think we can find great purpose and meaning even though we are part of this vastness. So I'm gonna be taking some of my comments um, from um, a couple of influential uh, books and, and things that uh, have really described the history of where we are. So there's a wonderful series of lectures in given by the Great Courses series, which is a wonderful uh, place where you can listen to lectures on a host of different things. But there's, there's, a, there's a great one called Big History that takes us from the Big Bang up through the development of life on this planet, up through... Um, the development of modern civilizations. It's 48 lectures that covers so much ground. It's basically the history of the entire human race, but also not just the human race, but also all of the things that led to the human race. It's really fabulous. And it gives us this grand perspective. There's a much more entertaining version of this by a man named Bill Bryson, A Short History of Nearly Everything, which I highly recommend. It's probably my favorite book. So entertaining, but he tells the same story. And that story is um, that we, uh, as uh, well, let me just say this, we, the, we now know that, or we believe we know, that 13.8 billion years ago, there was something called the Big Bang, which was not the beginning of everything, probably, but it was at least the beginning of our stage of everything, right? And after the dust settled, after the Big Bang, there were just two sm- elements that existed in the universe. There was hydrogen and helium. And hydrogen naturally attracted itself to the together through the force of gravity. Uh, that attraction... Uh, created more hydrogen atoms to come together. And over time, they became so compressed that they started to throw off heat. And then they basically lit up, right? So there's a fusion reaction that lit up the sky with all of these hydrogen suns that were uh, compressing together and throwing off healing them into the universe. And this went on for billions of years, right? So, but then one time that what happens when the death of suns happens is that there's an incredible amount of energy that's produced. And that process brought about the new, the periodic table of the elements, because with more heat and more uh, pressure, uh, you had this reaction that led to uh, actually hydrogen atoms compiling into different, um, into even higher levels of, of elements. And so that populated the universe with elements, right? And also matter was produced, things that would ultimately form into planets and moons and other things, right? And so that that sort of planetary cosmic process is what led to our planet existing and also having elements upon it, right? And then over a long period of time, uh, with the effect of the sun, um, there was water that was produced, that water produced an atmosphere ultimately, and within that atmosphere we had a transition from um, from non-biological life to biological life. Nobody knows how that transition occurred, but eventually you get this formation of life, right? And initially it was simple, just the simplest of cells, right? And then eventually they became more complex. They formed different types of cells that began to develop into plants. Plants used the sun for energy. 
um, and they began to reproduce themselves and so forth. And they started to digest some of that rock uh, that the, the made up the world and that rock that those digested particles became um, soil uh, and eventually other plants could grow in the soil and so forth. So there's this long and wonderful history. But at some, at the, at the latter stages of this, at least from our perspective, right? After 13.8 billion years ago, after 13 point billion years of the evolution of matter, human beings came into the world, right? And the human brain is the most sophisticated structure in the known universe. The most complex, 100 billion cells, trillions of neuro neurons, all connected together to enable you to do what you do in life. But they also, what, what also happened when human beings came into the world was something very significant. And that is that matter had evolved the ability to understand itself, right? So through our intelligence, through our rational awareness, through our ability to um, experiment and build theories and all of the things that human beings do that we now call science and knowledge and so forth, all of those things were the expression of matter in a new form, a higher form that could then um, explain the universe to itself, right? So an analogy for the, what's happened here that I like is that imagine there's a book sitting on a table and that book wanted to read itself, right? So the book is made up of material and matter. That's like, so the book is nature, right? Let's, in this metaphor, the book is nature itself and it wants to understand itself. It wants to read its own self. The book wants to read itself. So what it does is it evolves from the elements that make up the book itself, the words, the, 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 the ink. Um, it evolves a reader that can sit beside the table and read the book, right? So nature through us became aware and conscious of its own self. And the story I just told of this great history of the universe starting 13 point billion years ago, we figured that out, right? We figured that out. And that is one of the most remarkable things that has ever happened really, is nature awoke to itself and could actually build its own history and understand its own history and read its own self. So that single fact, which is indisputable really, that this is what we are and who we are, that single fact makes me conclude that this process, however long it took to bring into being a consciousness that can do that is, is, an, is a special one. It's a remarkable one. And that we have a special role to play in the world, okay? So uh, the other aspect that I think is very significant is that as we have attempted to unexplain the world, we have found out that the world is actually mathematical, right? And what does it tell us is about the world that we can develop mathematical theories to describe it, right? It tells us that the world is orderly, it's consistent, right? That it has a hidden mathematical code that we can discover. Imagine what Einstein did when he figured out the general and special theory of relativity, right? He took some theories that were developed based on observations, some mathematical formulae, deduced from those mathematical formulae, other mathematical formulae, that was it. So he basically they created a language, an abstract language that he was able to figure out based on how they had defined that language, new truths that then when we apply back into the world from this abstract place, when we apply it back into the world, it fits, right? So that fact that you can start with something concrete, go to something abstract, Deduce, do deductions, come back to something concrete means the nature of the world is orderly, right? It's based upon mathematical principles, right? So it's very significant to me that not only is the world based on mathematical principles, but that we have the ability to determine those mathematical principles and figure them out, right? So the world is intelligible, I mean, it's understandable to intelligence, right? So to me, that strongly suggests that there's intelligence underlying the creation of the world and the, and the nature of the world itself, right? But nevertheless, and that's a very, and Einstein himself believed that because of those same reasons as I understand it. But, you know, historically we have taken an approach where we have tried to explain this phenomenon, the phenomenon of the world that exists outside of us on three 
in three ways, right? Imagine you wake up and something new is on your kitchen counter, right? And you say, well, how did this get here, right? Well, how did it get there? There's three possibilities, right? It could have arisen there by chance. This is a possibility. We usually don't go to that. It could have arisen there. Maybe it was, maybe you hadn't been in their kitchen for a long, long time. And the natural laws of time had evolved this thing to sit there on your counter, right? And that's a theory about the way the world has developed what it is. What, um, and the other option is that some form of intelligence put it together, right? Or have, or had a role in putting it together, right? And so when modern science over the last 200 years, modern science systematically eliminated the third option, which is not necessarily problematic. What modern science wanted to do was understand the world without trying to impose upon it a metaphysical idea that it was built from a God or a divine source, right? It wanted, it, it wanted to understand the world only uh, based on what the world told it. It's kind of what, similarly to what I'm uh, saying. And so that was scientific scientists, that was science's sort of rules of the game, if you will, right? That's where there are its assumptions. Science is sometimes described as being methodologically materialist, meaning it's trying to have the material itself explain how it came to be. But when you look at that, you end up with really two strong options for how something came to be. One is it came there by chance, or the other is it just came to be because that's the way the world works. It was the natural output of the uh, laws that are baked into the reality of all things. So many materialist scientists have sort of really hearkened back or, or put a lot of their trust or uh, faith in this idea of chance, right? So when uh, Darwin's theory was put out there, and I wholeheartedly accept Darwin's theory uh, in its broadest forms. Uh, so, but what I'm trying to get at is something more fundamental. But nevertheless, when, when Darwin's theory was put out there, uh, a lot of people were troubled by this idea that something so complex as human beings or even the animals that they saw could have evolved um, out of um, out of chance processes, really, or that it that it was just nature itself that was causing these things to be. And so there was this kind of funny idea that developed that you know it was all by chance, and that uh, if actually you had you took a, a, a a group of monkeys and you put them in a room with typewriters that given an infinite amount of time, they would develop the complete works of Shakespeare. So what this was doing was basically saying, yes, these things that have happened that leave us to be very improbable, uh, they, they are very improbable, but given an infinite amount of time, anything can happen. So it's the power of good luck, right? So we exist in our world with all of these powers because uh, we were just really lucky in the grand lottery of the world. So there's another idea. This is morphed into sort of a similar idea uh, that was proposed and sort of built out by the um, science and philosopher, scientist and philosopher Stephen Hawking, who said, you know, we could be part of just one grand um, infinite number of potential universes. And we just happen to be the one universe that happened to develop all of these wonderful capacities because the laws happen to be set up that way but there's some grand lottery of universes and we got lucky, we pulled the right one. And since we don't know all of the other possibilities that failed, uh, we're making a big deal out of the fact that this is remarkable that it's happened. So th that's a very strong um, atheist argument for how things can come to be that it's, it's really, um, it's just chance and, and the power of good luck. The other thing that um, these theories have rested on is this idea that the laws of nature are purely deterministic. And the fact that human beings have the capacities we do of free will, intelligence, and so forth, really is still a, a reflection of these deterministic laws. So by determinism, I mean that all of the nature appears to be captive to its own laws, right? Water acts in a very consistent way according to laws of how water acts and then how you know, hydrogen and oxygen interact on a fundamental level that gives it the character of water, right? So the world uh, on the macro level of water and rocks, nature itself is entirely deterministic. It follows nature's laws, right? But the problem is that with human beings, and this has been the great challenge of these theories, that is that, you know, human beings seem to have free will. And this has been a problem since the foundation of these ideas. Um, 
you know, this is a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge. We could have painted that red. We could have painted it yellow. We could have painted it blue. Now, um, so some um, philosophers would say, well, what, the, the, what we determined to do in painting it red was determined since the beginning of time. And all we're seeing is the outflow of these mindless laws um, being, um, uh, you know, being uh, flowed out over time and, and producing outcomes over time. Um, the problem is it's really hard to understand how mind, the ability to do free will, creativity, all of these other things could have come out of mindless laws. That's the fundamental challenge of determinism. And then also, if you say, okay, if, let's say you do say, okay, everything's deterministic. Well, what does it say about the nature of the laws themselves if they build a mind, right? Wouldn't deterministic laws that build a mind have mind behind it to begin with? So determinism is a, is, has been challenged on many fronts. And um, these, these two ideas of chance and determinism make up a lot of the sort of atheistic perspectives. But if you look at the last 200 years of modern science, trying to explain things without there being recourse to a god or a mind, we've really hit up against some real sort of ceilings in our ability to explain things. So, and the biggest problem is we can't explain us, right? So if you look at, if you look at the theories that are out there, they're highly speculative for how rational thought developed, how consciousness developed, where creativity comes from, from language, um, music, the virtues we express, all of these things are really effectively not explainable in the terms of, of that science has chosen to frame itself of chance and determinism. They're all ex unexplained and really seemingly unexplainable. So the, uh, there's a few other points that have come up as we've learned more about the world. Um, and that is that the root of life seems to be information. So and this is, comes up in physics, but it's also in biology as well. Probably the most classic example of this is DNA itself, right? So DNA is, you know, four codons, right? Uh, a, T, C, and G, right? Adenosine, thymine, uh, guanine, and so forth, right? And cytosine. So these letters um, are coded in different, or are, are, um, are come in different, uh, are, uh, I'm trying to, they're like, uh, they're sequentially uh, placed in such a way as to transmit a biological code. So the question though becomes not so much, and it's a big question how ADCG came up, but um, the, the, the other question is, where did the information come from that formed the biological code itself? So if, if DNA is a code, that's a language. A language expresses information. So where did the information come from? And so, you know, one philosopher, a gentleman by the name of Stephen Meyer has, has made this point several times and throughout his books that, you know, the, the root of information, the only known cause of information in the world is intelligence. And so intelligence must be at the root of everything, right? So when you look at these three possibilities, did the world come about by chance? Did the world come about simply by determination, determinism? Or did it come about, come about through intelligence and will? Intelligence and will is a very, very strong idea. In fact, I actually think, honestly, it's pretty obvious. I, I don't struggle with this at all. That doesn't, by the way, mean that chance and determinism don't play a role, right? Determinism is, or the natural laws being deterministic creates a, an orderly playing field, right? You can't play football without an orderly playing field, without laws, without structure. It creates a structure. Chance creates diversity. Chance creates shuffling of the deck to, to uh, potentiate diversity, right? But to me, you can't get there. You can't get to what exists without intelligence and will, which is why I believe at some level that intelligence and will must be at the root of all reality. So my conclusions from looking at the world, from understanding the world, is that chance and mindless determining processes cannot be the sole explanation for the world that we know. Creation must have come from a source that is intelligent and has will, because we have will. It's created something that's intelligent and will. Not directly, but through the processes that we know of uh, in studying through science, but um, it's created that. So it's, almost, it's possible to understand how it could have created that without having that quality itself. 
We also have to recognize if we start to think seriously about this intelligence, it must be a mind beyond anything we can likely conceive, right? I mean, we are just this living on this thin biofilm, right? So, you know, that whatever force brought this all in existence has to be something that we can't fully appreciate. Yet we almost must have some connection with though, because we are able to do this. We are able to do those mathematical equations that I described before. So in some ways that intelligence must be bearded in us, right? We are completely dependent upon that force for our existence. Um, and then the other point I wanna make is that human beings, though we have our limitations and occupy a very small niche of a vast universe, we really do have distinctive abilities that are profoundly significant. So it's really through us that all creation has become conscious and can really determine its own future. Mindlessness has become mind. And that is a very significant thing. So I actually think that not much has changed from the ancient person who looked out at this grand landscape and knew it must have come from intelligence and will. I think that in some ways, the discoveries of science over the last two centuries have given us more details about it. And it's also thrown aside some of all our, our, our other maybe theological conceptions of how it happened, but it hasn't changed the fundamental paradigm. And that is, it still simply makes sense, makes the most sense that the world has come from some form of intelligence or will, okay? So that's where I'm at that with that. I think a lot of people feel this intuitively. Um, they believe in God intuitively because they, it just seems obvious. Um, and I think I basically feel the same way with all of those people. I think in some ways this is just obvious. Um, but I felt the need to kind of spell it out so that I can justify my beliefs in a rational way. But I really do think at some level that those folks that just feel it intuitively are, are feeling something valid intuitively. So the next question though, is does God interact with humanity? I mean, that's just saying that there's a will and intelligence at the root of thing. That doesn't necessarily mean that that will or intelligence cares about us. I think there's a lot of data. I think there's a lot of evidence that says it does care about us, right? We wake up in our lives and there's food to eat and there's people to love us and all of these things. So you, that doesn't happen if nobody cares about you, right? But nevertheless, we have to ask the question, does that God interact with humanity, right? And many people believe that the God does not interact with humanity. So this is where I think we're going to take the same approach we took before and say, what does the history of, the, of the, the, this question show us, right? So what do we know about whether God interacts with humanity? So, you know, there have been um, all of the great religions of the world, virtually all of them, explicitly say that they are reflection of the will of that intelligence at the root of all reality, right? They explicitly say that. They frame their um, presentation of that differently. You know, so Jesus Christ claimed to be the representative of the will intelligence that exists in all creation, who we described as the Father, and he is the Son, representing that upon, upon the world, right? The prophet Muhammad described himself as a prophet and as a messenger, right? So as someone who reflected that will and intelligence and was presenting the will of that will and intelligence to us as like a messenger would deliver a message, right? So they're all presenting it in different ways. And so uh, one of the things that I think is very troubling to people when they approach religion is it all seems like so disjointed, right? It all seems like this cacophony of ideas. People take religious ideas, they become tribal with them, they form their own tribes, and then they don't believe in the other religion. And the whole thing just seems disorganized and disunifying and incoherent, right? What has brought me to a new understanding is my exposure to the Baha'i faith and learning about the principles that Baha'u'llah taught, which really, and I'll outline these in the next few uh, slides here, uh, have really gotten me from the point of believing, yes, there must be an intelligence at the root of all reality, to understanding on a much deeper level how that intelligence interacts with humanity. So let me share that with you now. So Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith, said that we can think about the intelligence that is at the root of all human, uh, humanity like a painter in a painting, that we are living in the painting and we have this experience, we are a created thing, right? So a created thing that is dependent on something else 
like the painters, the painting is dependent on the painter, can't necessarily understand the painter herself, right? There is not that we are living in the world of the painting. So everything we know and experience is within the world of that painting, right? So our, our ability to understand the will and intelligence that exist at the root of reality, which I'm just gonna go ahead and start calling God, is limited, right? Because we're living in a world, all of our, all, everything we know, everything we can possibly conceive is in that world, like, like a drop of paint would have understood in that painting. So Baha'u'llah says that fundamentally the will and intelligence that exists at the root of all reality is unknowable to us because we are out, we are living in the painting and the creation and everything we can understand is within that painting, but God doesn't exist within the painting. So uh, we can't really understand God on that level. What he said is that uh, we can understand God through his creation. Now, I wanna tell you a story. I grew up in rural Pennsylvania. And when I was a kid, I would hike up the mountains into the woods. And um, I got to the top of one of these hills once, similar to in this picture. This is a picture from Pennsylvania, not quite the same mountains. And I had, you know, it had taken me half a day to hike up there. And I laid on a rock and beside me, there was a little anthill. And I saw these ants that were sort of scurrying around because of my presence. They saw me there. And I was thinking to myself, what are imagine these ants and what their life is like, you know? So let's think about the situation of those ants, because in a sense, our world, we are in a similar situation to those ants. We're living in a faraway niche of the universe, right? Nobody's ever even been here, right? Nobody, as we know of, has ever even visited us, right? And here this visitor comes, that was me, and I'm disturbing these poor ants who have probably never seen anything like me, right? So I'm completely foreign to them. But imagine we're those ants and we're trying to understand God and we're trying to understand our place in the world. Our place, our understanding would be the way on ants understand the world, right? Our, our understanding would be if God were to appear to us, for instance, he would appear as a big ant or some form of, you know, something we would respect, right? Um, so what the other thing that Baha'u'llah tells us is if the interaction with God happens through our own reality, our own world. So in a beautiful passage, Baha'u'llah said something very important. He said, all that sages and mystics have said or written about God have never exceeded, nor can they ever hope to exceed the limitations with man's finite mind have been strictly subjected. To whatever, to whatever heights the mind of the most exalted of men may soar, however great the depths which the detached and understanding heart can penetrate, such mind and heart can never transcend that which is the creature, creature of their own conception and the product of their own thoughts. Every attempt, which from the beginning that hath no beginning, hath been made to visualize and know God is limited by the exigencies of his own creation. So let's think about this for a moment. So, you know, human beings can only hear certain decibels, right? There are, but sound exists outside of what we can hear, right? Our eyes can only certain, can appreciate certain wavelengths of life, but light exists outside of our ability. So, you know, we have limitations in our own conceptions, right? But God is beyond that. Even the creation of God is beyond that, right? So Baha'u'llah is telling us that really our own understanding of God is within our own reality. But God is, God is kind, right? So, um, so he reveals to his creation through his creation, right? So we know God through the creation itself, right? And so we know this through, uh, Baha'u'llah tells us, through everything that exists, everything, every re everything we experience reflects the reality of God. Um, but there's also this specific, all of these great religions, Baha'u'llah tells us, also reflect that reality of God. And they're not trying to trick us, right? Baha'u'llah says, you know, basically, God is not trying to trick us, right? All of the great religions have really educated us more and more about God. So we all know this story of Moses that goes up to the mountain and he receives the Ten Commandments through a burning bush. It's a metaphor. It's, he didn't actually encounter a burning bush. He described it in this way. And he asks God, what are you? And he says, I am that I am, right? 
So God is abstract to us, not something we can know other than he exists, right? But, you know, progressively, these great founders of these great religions who bought, brought these revelations gradually expanded our concepts of God. So our concepts of God are our own concepts. And the wonderful story of Christ at the well with a tribal woman who, you know, this tribal woman had, um, he met her there and she said, you know, listen, you know, we, list, we worship our God in the mountains and the Jews worship their God in the Jerusalem. And Jesus says something very important because at that time of history, everything was tribal, right? Everybody had their own God and it defined their tribe. What Christ said is something very profound. He said, he said that God is spirit and his worshipers must worship his spirit and in truth, in spirit and in truth, right? And he said in that same passage, he said, God is not in the mountain or in the temple. God is spirit, right? So there's this universal conception of God, that universal conception of God, which was a change from how we had previously conceived of God that Christ gave us, allowed us to transcend our tribalisms and really come together across European society, seeing ourselves all as part of one God, right? And so this idea of the oneness of God led to human unity because it made us stop worshiping something concrete and worshiping something transcendent, something transcendent that everyone can appreciate. And of course, Christ complex that with the idea. I mean, he, with that idea was the idea that God was just and caring and that we end up worshiping those qualities of justice and wisdom and forgiveness and mercy and so forth. And so the great religion of Islam um, uh, carried the same idea forward, right? And, you know, Islam is a quintessential monotheistic religion that eschewed the worship of idols in any form. What we wanted to do was worship a transcendent reality. And the Prophet Muhammad said that places of worship call on God and you should not call on anything besides God. So Baha'u'llah tells us something really, uh, also really important about the nature of um, the, the uh, teachings of the great revealers of, of God. He said, whatever duty, and this is in a prayer, it's framed as a prayer. He said, whatever duty, God, thou, hast prescribed unto thy servants of extolling to the utmost thy majesty and glory, is but a token of thy grace unto them, that they may be enabled to ascend unto the station conferred upon their own inmost being, the station of the knowledge of their own selves. So Baha'u'llah is telling us that the purpose of religion and the purpose of us worshiping God is actually so that we may become knowledgeable about our own selves. And that these revelations that have come in the world and that have urged us to, to worship God have done so for that purpose. Baha'u'llah says, through their teachings, every man will advance and develop until he attains a station at which he can manifest all the potential forces with which his own inmost true self have been endowed. So religion our concepts of God do change over time. And they're changed by the manifestations of God, the messengers of God, in order for us to grow and develop. And Baha'u'llah says that whenever a new uh, manifestation or messenger God comes into the world to reveal a new message, the, the idea of God is transformed into a broader one so that it becomes a greater source of human unity. And it also sort of um, emphasizes those teachings that lead us to bring out the forces that exist in us uh, with which every one of us has been endowed. So what about then this question about Christ claiming to be God or the prophet Muhammad claiming to be a messenger of God? How do we understand that? Um, because, you know, that doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, he's simply a man, right? You know, has all the limitations that we experience. How can we understand that from a theological perspective? What Baha'u'llah says is that they are not God. And he, did, he himself said, I am not God, but I bear, I'm bringing the revelation of God to you. So they are, not, they are not God themselves, but they are God to us, right? Within our limited world, God is revealing himself to us through us, right? So he said, would, all, would any of the all-embracing manifestations of God to declare, I am God, he speaks the truth for by 
it has repeatedly been demonstrated through each of these revelations that through their revelation, their attributes, the revelation of God, his name and attributes are made manifest in the world. This is why Baha'u'llah called these great figures that began the great religions of humanity manifestations of God, because they manifest the qualities of God to us. So if you look at these great religions, you can see that they all build upon the teachings of the one before. As I said, God is not trying to trick us. So Baha'u'llah has brought a religion into the world that helps me make sense of the reality of our world, not only outside of us, but the reality of, of humanity's relationship to God. You know, if we look empirically at the world, there are every there are churches and mosques that dot the landscape of every world, of every of every country, right? That have throughout the centuries called people to worship God, which Baha'u'llah says is the process that we can then come to understand our true and noble selves. What Baha'u'llah says in this day is that it is time for us to have the most universalistic conception of God that we can have. And he told his followers, he's in his own book of laws, he said, consort with the followers of all religions with amity and concord, that they may inhale from you the sweet fragrance of God. Beware lest amidst men the flame of foolish ignorance overpower you. All things proceed from God and unto them all they, unto him they return. He is the source of all things and in him all things are ended. Through what Baha'u'llah has done is he has given us a conception of God, which we now can understand is actually for us, for us as human beings. It's a human conception of God, but he's giving it to us to understand that um, then we're able to see all of our brothers and sisters all around the world as, as all living under that same force. And that big tent of unity now can now encompass all humanity, much like uh, you know, Jesus's conception um, had brought all of Europe together. So I, I'm going to end with this quote, and I love it, because this gives us a sense of the meaning of the revelation of God for today. Baha'u'llah says to his followers, and to everyone really, O ye beloved of the Lord, commit not that which defiles the limpid stream of love or destroyeth the sweet fragrance of friendship. By the righteousness of the Lord, you were created to show love to one another and not perversity and rancor. Take pride not in love for yourselves, but in love for your fellow creatures. Glory not in love for your country, but in your love for all mankind. Baha'u'llah has taken this universalistic conception of God, which I think makes is coherent with the reality that exists outside of us in terms of the natural world, but also humanity's experience with religion has made it so universal and then asks us to, to, to use that universal conception of God um, to recognize in everyone as being reflections of that. Um, and, and that becomes the source of our glory, not in love for our country, but in our love for all mankind. So I edit a site called sifterofdust.org and everybody's welcome to, to go there uh, if they'd like to learn more about the Baha'i faith. Thank you so much for having me today. I think this is a topic that's definitely on a lot of people's minds, especially with current events. Um, so yeah, we'd love to have your questions. Um, you can put them in the chat and I'll read them out. Question is from Geoff, Jeff, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, is the irreducible complexity theory another form of the God of the gaps fallacy? So the God of the gaps fallacy is this idea that Anything that is not explainable in terms of a chance of deterministic processes, um, you know, people attribute it to a God. Um, and um, that the process of science over the last 200 years has been to basically eliminate things that were previously attributed to gods um, or to God um, to understand things. And I, I think in some ways this is a misperception of what the concept of God is, right? So God is not a God, is not filling, is, is not active in the world in that sense, right? And this is what I'll get to in the next talk. This is not the concept of God that I as a Baha'i have, or even do I believe that the older faiths have as well. They believe, they believe that the ultimate order of things, the ultimate basis of things, the gaps and the non-gaps, 
could not have existed without some form of will intelligence at the basis of it. And that's the concept of God. So you're not trying to fill in gaps in our knowledge about the material natural world with some form of God. Uh, what you're doing is you're saying the whole sphere of it is sustained by a force that it exists outside of it. So this allows us to continue to try and understand the world in terms of the natural processes that exist. Let me give you an example. The origin of life, right? It's a, it's a very difficult quandary. How did non how did non-material matter or non-organic matter become organic matter? How did that transition occur? Nobody really knows. I'm not saying God did it, right? I'm saying that those natural forces uh, that existed evolved and, and there was a transition there. And if we study that, we will eventually figure out how inanimate matter could evolve into animate matter. That's not my argument. My argument is, is if you look at the whole process, it's impossible for me to understand how the laws themselves and the forces themselves could have come to being. I'm going before those laws and forces. I'm not putting God as one of those laws and forces. I'm putting God before all those laws and forces and saying, you can't get there from here without some form of mind and intelligence being at the root of it. Um, and so that's just my thought on the God of the gaps point. It's, that's a, that is a, that is a good question and uh, one worth pointing out, but I think it also uh, gets to what we're talking about when we're talking about God, that it's not a God that fills in the gaps in our knowledge, right? It's the God, it's, it's the root of everything. So. Um, next question. Do you think that panpsychism, the idea that everything has a form of consciousness, is a valid explanation for the emergence of consciousness? Um, so, you know, the challenge in, uh, let me just outline this for folks so they understand the question, which is a very good question. Um, when you get to this question of how did matter, you have just matter that's deterministic, and then you have mind that can paint the golden gate bridge red, yellow, or whatever, right? So you have these two things. How did one come out of the other, right? So atheistic philosophers has always said it's only matter. It's all just matter. And mind is just, uh, some guys just even say it doesn't exist, right? It doesn't exist. You're actually, everything in your mind is just deterministic stuff. It doesn't really truly exist, which I find very hard to conceptualize. So that's one idea. You could say it's all matter. So panpsychism basically says it's all mind, right? So everything is basically mind. And I sort of lean more towards that view uh, in that, uh, uh, and I, I'm sensitive to that view. Um, the, uh, so I do think that I, as, as we'll get through, I, I, th there's, I think that there's truth to panpsychism, but I don't know if the mind is in the matter itself, right? Um, I think the mind is behind the matter in a way that we, can never understand. Um, so, but I think panpsychism is more getting to a little bit more of what, what could be an explanation for it. And it's becoming a more popular idea in philosophy, by the way, because there, people are making the same conclusion I'm drawing. It, you just can't get there from here, right? You can't get there from just matter to mind and to everything we know. Not only can you get to the, the mind that we express and exhibit, you can't get to these complex structures themselves, even the non-mental ones. How did they come to be that way? in so sophisticated an interaction based on chance and deterministic processes, it's really a problematic problem and nobody really has a good idea for it. And that's really a, what a lot of this thrust is to come and look at look afresh at the ideas. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, Please let you. me know if it didn't. Um, Derek says, I saw a video where a quantum physicist said that quantum physics will prove that there is a force that is responsible for everything and one could call that force God. So I guess, what do you think about that? It's probably more a question for Stephen Phelps, who's been on these. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that uh, there are other people that can probably answer that question better than me. I mean, I think that we're trying to get to the root of life. I've heard Steve talk about this. And um, my understanding of Steve's answer, I believe he was asked this in maybe one of the presentations on Modern Perspectives. And I think he gave a similar answer to what I understand the Baha'i teachings to be that, that it's, we're never going to understand um, all of life in terms of 
what what we're looking for as an explanation for things is actually going to ultimately exist outside of the physical world. So whatever we find in the physical world is simply still an expression of the uh, forces that exist. Let me see if let me um, let me read for you um, just to give you a little bit. Of, see if I have my how the strength of my glasses. If I can see my small print on my printout here, let me read for you a. I don't know if I can do this. Um, nope, I can't, sorry. Uh, I was gonna read for you a passage of Baha'u'llah in which he describes this will and intelligence that exists behind all things, what it really is um, and how we can think about it. And he says, it's, it's, you can think of it as a word or a command. Um, it's a will, right? So an analogy for this is, and this is, this is an infinitely modern analogy, right? So you say to your iPhone, hey Siri, do this, right? So imagine you're living in the iPhone, right? What do you experience, right? So there's a difference between you who speaks, the, well, you, not if you're living in the iPhone, but the speaker of hey Siri and the actual command itself of what you tell Siri to do, right? So what Baha'u'llah says is that we experience the effects of the command. That's my understanding. And so what we're experiencing is only the effects of everything. We're not experiencing the speaker. The speakers, you have no chance of getting to know the speaker. You're only going to see the command, right? And so, you know, I think that that's, that's my understanding of what Baha'u'llah says, that our perspective on um, the nature of God's interaction in the world is where, and then he goes, Baha'u'llah goes on to say that nature itself is the command of God, right? So then we can come up with completely, quote, naturalistic explanations within a Baha'i framework. Like, we're, there's no gaps. We're trying to come up with naturalistic explanations. But it's all because of a divine command at the end. So where God, nature is sort of the, the effect uh, of that, that then produces us. Right, so we're a couple steps down the line. These are just my humble philosophical thoughts and my understanding of the Baha'i writings on these issues. But I think they're quite, I think the Baha'i writings are very sophisticated on these issues. They're not, they're, they're, they're really, really impressive. Um, and that's one of the things that impresses me so much about Baha'u'llah, not only the beauty of his teachings and the beauty of his words and how stirring they are and how the concepts, it's just that he's also created a theological framework, which is really compelling. And it's, it, it's coherent with the rest of the world. And it doesn't trip up on some of these things that folks are asking questions about. Thank you. Um, Aaron asks, is there a good response to those who say we're living in a computer simulation? I think we might be. So let's look at this. This is actually an interesting idea. Um, no, I, I don't know that we're living in a computer simulation, but uh, a computer simulation is, when I said I think I might be, I don't, I don't know how I feel about this, but um, the basic framework of what it would be if you were actually living in the computer simulation, to me, is very similar to what is outlined in the Baha'i Writings. So, and I actually have used this in some of my talks. If you go back to some of my talks, I mean, if you're in the video game, which is a computer simulation, what can you understand of God? Baha'u'llah says we can't understand anything about God. You're living in the video game, right? You all your everything you've ever known, everything you've ever seen, everything you've been experienced is in that game. That's your entire world, and the entire world you could ever know is in that game. And so, um, but, um, so it's in that game. So what you experience are the effects of the creator in the game itself, which is kind of similar to what I was just describing. So I, I think the computer simulation idea, which I know is getting very pop popular, is kind of a way that a lot of people are trying to get out of this thorny knot that I just outlined about chance and determinism not being the explanation. It's almost, it's a theistic way, right? But it's not a theistic way that uh, goes, has us go back to the sort of God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? It's another way of thinking it in, in secular terms. 
but the basic framework of how things are is very similar to what's outlined in the Baha'i writings to me. I think it's actually a really good way to think about how to think about the theology of the Baha'i faith. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Williams, for joining us again and sharing your insightful and philosophical thoughts on this topic. Um, now I'll go ahead and, yeah, and introduce our speaker for next week. So next week, our speaker will be Mr. Payam Akhavan, and his topic is, what are Baha'is doing to address human rights violations around the world? So again, these talks occur every Saturday at noon Eastern time. So please invite your friends and family. And if you'd like to be on the mailing list and you're not already, please fill out the contact form that I will put again in the chat below. So now we're gonna close with a writing of the Bob, who was the forerunner of the Baha'i faith set to music. To thee I repair for refuge, and towards all thy signs I set my heart. O Lord, whether traveling or at home, and in my occupation or in my work, I place my whole trust. my whole trust, trust in thee. Grant me then thy sufficing help so as to make me independent of all things. O oh, thou who art unsurpassed in thy mercy. my whole trust, trust in thee, I place my whole trust, trust in thee, I place my whole trust, trust in Okay, great. Thank you again. Um, see you all next week.